We joined the SEC to avoid our rivals like Texas, Oklahoma, and Clemson in football. Uh, just compete in another sport like baseball, basketball, or tiddlywinks. Hey everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week I actually have two cartoons. I'll get to the second one in a little bit. But it is basically the beginning of the college football season. And as I uh, had stated in a previous episode about the expansion of the SEC with Texas and Oklahoma coming aboard, it is going to change the landscape of college football and potentially all of amateur sports on the collegiate level. with And that's really the theme of my cartoon today for uh, the first half of the show. And that is Texas and Oklahoma, two traditional schools in football. And of course, Oklahoma has had an outstanding baseball program as well, Texas. And also Oklahoma has had a pretty good wrestling program. All this just adds and adds to a, a potential monopoly by the SC schools going forward as they grow and just get bigger and better and really more professional. And I've actually uh, hypothesized on this show that I can actually see eventually, especially with the deal that the players have made, where college uh, sports just cannot stop the inevitable and just make the college sports on the Division I level. And particularly for the bigger conferences, and I'm talking about the Big Ten, the SEC, the ACC, the Pac-12, and of course, who knows what's going to happen with the Big 12. But I can see them really turning into professional minor leagues, especially in football and basketball. That was the purpose of the cartoon today. And really, uh, the inspiration for that not only comes with the growth of the SEC, but just the latest uh, top 20 preseason polls in college football. And two things hit you right away as a college football fan. One is that the SEC dominates. Number two is that the SEC dominates. And number three, most of the teams in the top 25 seem to come from south of the Mason-Dixon board. And I, I'm not going to mention any particular newspaper or magazine uh, about their top 25 because you know, there are so many top 25. But I think that they all have come to the conclusion that you're going to see an Alabama Clemson and uh, probably in that football playoff, along with quite a few SEC teams, uh, Georgia, Texas A&M, that was one of the focuses of the uh, cartoon in one of the big bowl games going forward. Just, just to give you an idea, here's some of the teams that the SEC has been predicted to have, let's say, well, at least in the preseason top 25, but also probably at the end of the year, they'll probably be in the top 10, at least in the top 15. Of course, you have a guy that really, uh, their name, their school should be etched in stone as the prohibitive number one, and that is Alabama, the Crimson Tide. Uh, and Alabama, which right now it's synonymous with college football championships, I think they've played in every uh, uh, you know playoff game uh, of this new, let's say, round of playoffs since it's been uh, really invented by uh, the NCAA. But Alabama is up there again as they continue. One thing I will do in a future episode. I'm going to tell you that the growth of college football is this for the South. You know, the perception is, and at least when I was growing up, that college football was very regionalized and that most of the players were coming from either that particular state, let's say Alabama, or at least in that immediate area, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, maybe Tennessee, etc. I tell you, I was looking at some of the incoming recruits in uh, a magazine. I'm just going to give you Syracuse as, re as an example. Here's Syracuse playing in the Dome, has not really had a, a competitive 
or a powerful, really like seven and five, six and six in some of their better years in the last 15, 20 years. But they have not one, but two recruits coming from Hawaii to play in Syracuse, which I find uh, really fascinating. As But you can just see the growth of college football as these schools, especially as the uh, really the colleges condense and become really focused with the power five. And I think this is where it's going. And, and as I stated, I, I'm really, uh, I have a theory that's going to be that the SEC just continues to expand and finally really takes in 40 teams that wants to play a professional league. And then they'll have their own uh, own playoffs. Now, you can call me crazy and all the, all the rest, but how many people thought 15 years ago that players would be allowed uh, to make their own deals? Now, they might not be big time deals per se, but some of them are going to get big deals, probably from sneaker companies or clothing or apparel or whatever. And it's, it's just a matter of time and the right player and all the rest. Put it this way. Suppose this was about 30 years ago when you had Michael Jordan or, or Bo Jackson playing, especially a guy like Bo Jackson playing at the college level, playing not one but two sports. Those sponsors would have been banging on his door and he probably would have had a plethora of offers and a plethora of sponsors paying him to endorse different products. Anyway, Alabama is really the consensus number one. I haven't seen a, uh, any poll and I could be wrong about that, but uh, the magazines and the sources I've been going, Alabama seems to be the <laughs> uh, number one team in the land as, as we break for college football this week as, as we come upon the Labor Day weekend. I will tell you this, Labor Day is probably, I, I think it's, in my mind, it's always been the most depressing holiday because it ends summer. And if you're a kid, which I am, a big kid really, in a 60-year-old body, I used to say this, uh, my, my, my favorite seasons of the year were <laughs> Christmas and summer. And summer always felt like one long day. And then, bang, Labor Day hits and all of that freedom, all of that just fun in the sun just ends as we go back to school. At least Labor Day with the opening of college football, and it seems that's what uh, pro football is doing is allowing college football to have basically their own little wedge of September to themselves. It kind of offers some solace for you as you're going back to school that, wow, there's a whole uh, chock full schedule of great college football games over the Labor Day weekend. Anyway, Alabama number one, Oklahoma number two, Clemson number three. It's kind of getting redundant because I probably could have used the same three guys, three, same three teams the previous five years. Ohio State number four as the Big Ten finally breaks in uh, to this. Georgia number five, there's another Southern school or south of the Mason-Dixon, as as uh, I was saying uh, at the top of the show. Then number six, Iowa State. All right. They're kind of new to the whole thing because when I was growing up, Iowa State was never. And they'd win one or two games, but they, they were just fodder for Oklahoma or, or Texas, or whatever, or Iowa when they would play their rivalry game. But Iowa State would just be, pfft, or Nebraska. I just always remember the games being like 52-3. And, or, you know, or they would take it easy on them and beat them 48 to nothing. Texas A&M, interesting thing about Texas A&M, they're probably the ones who are most upset with Texas and Oklahoma coming into the SEC because that was the whole point of Texas A&M. I couldn't even believe this, and this is just... Uh, just off the cuff, I couldn't believe how much money the Texas A&M Aggies actually get from their boosters. They're one of the top three or four every year. I couldn't believe it. And it's only because it's never equated really at the championships. Texas is really held firm as the be-all and end-all uh, college program since the time I was growing up. And you're talking about 40, 50 years. It was always Texas and then you know, the Southwest Conference, when, when they were in it, it was Texas and then everybody else. Occasionally, you might have a Houston or an Arkansas fighting them. 
I never remember Texas A&M really giving Texas any kind of fight. Texas A&M leaves for the Southeast Conference, and I think they did it for a number of reasons, and there were good reasons in terms of their athletic program. They wanted their own identity separate from the other Texas schools, and the SEC offered that. Plus, it was a competitive place. I don't think anyone is going to argue that the SEC is probably the most powerful football league right now. It might be better than the NFL. But um, now with Texas and Oklahoma, who were their two chief rifles for recruiting, even though Oklahoma played uh, when I was growing up in the Big Eight and Texas A&M was in the Southwest Conference, then, then they cobbled really those groups together, those conferences together to form the Big 12. But they were still always kind of like the stepchild. Then they go to the SEC, and now they're going to be the stepchild, no matter how much money the boosters seem to give, because it's always going to be the Texas Longhorns, it seems, and the Oklahoma Sooners. So Texas A&M, really, uh, purpose again of the cartoon is that they just don't seem to be able to kind of free themselves, that they're always fettered to Texas and Oklahoma. Here's a wild one, and this is going to be interesting. Cincinnati is a uh, favorite to be one of those, uh, the Big Five and then the outside conferences. They're in the AAC. Uh, they had a tremendous season last year. I thought they they blew their opportunity to upset Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Uh, that was really a missed opportunity for the program. Nonetheless, they got to play in one of the traditional New Year's Day po uh, uh, bowls. Well, they're back again. This time on the ledger, they have Notre Dame, and I believe they play Indiana, which in itself has a pretty good uh, Michael uh, Penix quarterback who got hurt late in the season. But he could be, especially if uh, things unfold well for Indiana, He might just, we might just be talking about a Heisman Trophy candidate there. And he may go late in the uh, the vote where he might be one of the three being invited to New York. So that'll be interesting. Cincinnati, though. In one poll, according to the New York Post, I'll even give that to you, seems to be their number eight, followed by Oregon, or we could call it Nike University. <laughs> I tell you, they have more outfits <laughs> than my wife and her walk-in closet. No, she doesn't have a walk-in closet, but boy, they at one point, I think, have 284 potential uniforms. In one season alone, they had 284 different combinations for uniforms. They go with the green, the yellow, the gray, the black. It's amazing. Plus, they have all different helmet uh, logos and decals and uh, colors. It's, it's amazing. But Oregon, and they were one of the teams I said that would probably be part of, let's say, this growing, I think, uh, football league that the SEC, I think, envisions. And I have, no, I have no inside information. It's just what I see as a fan and a student of the, uh, of the game in terms of watching it as it's developed over the years. Because I even said to many of my, my buddies, and I've said it here before, these conferences with these members, it, it's, it's not, it, it, it's fluid. The, these conferences are not over in terms of uh, forming and adding new members or getting rid of members and all the rest of it. And here it was a perfect uh, example with Texas and Oklahoma. That was huge for the SEC. But Oregon, I, I could see them coming aboard. They would be definitely sponsored by uh, Nike. And you, you could see them having an edge on sponsorship for their players. And this is why uh, this recent uh, decision allowing players to have sponsorship or making a name of their names or their uh, profiles or their faces, or whatever, is so huge and how it's going to really change the college landscape. I'm telling you, it's going to change it. Oregon, anyway, wraps up. Uh, and then Wisconsin, another team when I was a kid that was terrible. This year, they actually play Notre Dame. And Notre Dame, since I, I, I've been following college football and I, I – really since about 68, 69, they haven't played Wisconsin or Minnesota or Illinois that I recall from the Big Ten. Well, I'm fulfilling one of those dreams because they are going to play Wisconsin and Notre Dame. It's going to be played in Chicago. 
this year. That should be a good game, and it should be very telling. And, of course, Army, the shirt I'm wearing today, they actually get Wisconsin five, six weeks into the season. And that should be a real test for the Army Black Knights of the Hudson or the Cadets. Number 11 is Notre Dame. All right. Still, as I always talk about, they are the uh, curse of the Peacock. They haven't won plus – actually, since they signed the contract with NBC plus one year, maybe that's what I should do. Peacock plus one. Uh, they have been cursed at not winning a national title, and it doesn't look too good right now or promising. It would have to take really them – they really, and of course, they're back playing the independent schedule. They're not in the ACC, even though I, they have a full uh, ledger of games, in, in quite a few games with the ACC. I think they play North Carolina as well, which is uh, another quote unquote up and coming team in the ACC. USC, a traditional football power, number 12. Indiana, number 13. I was just saying about uh, their quarterback. He's exciting to watch. I've seen him in uh, a couple of games. I thought he was exciting to watch. Kind of re reminds you of the old 60s kind of quarterbacks running around. They can throw. Plus, he is a lefty, which kind of makes it more fun. I don't know what it is about lefty quarterbacks. It, it just changes the whole perspective of a football game. Don't know why. Obviously, it's because they're few and far between, and they are uh, a rare breed of players. Plus, everybody always thinks that lefty quarterbacks or lefty pitchers are a little bit off the deep end, which makes them kind of interesting characters as well. Florida, another SEC team. Iowa, 15. North Carolina, they may have a Heisman uh, Trophy candidate as well in Sam Howell, their quarterback. LSU, another SEC team. They're back. Penn State. Washington, the Huskies, number 19, number 20. This one's an outsider looking in, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. Uh, they had a nice year last year. And, in fact, I believe they won their bowl game. Miami, number 21, Coastal Carolina, probably had one of the most interesting, if not one of the most exciting games during the regular season last year when – BYU and Coastal Carolina scheduled a game because uh, of postponements and cancellations due to the pandemic. They got together. Uh, it was broadcast on cable. ESPN showed the game. It was it was a really exciting, competitive. It reminded me of old time nineteens, like sixties football, where there wasn't a lot of scoring, but there was a lot of spectacular plays. And it really came down to uh, the final series before Coastal Carolina outlasted B BYU, the Cougars. Texas, number 23. Now, they're going to still play in the Big 12 and then, of course, join. But you can consider them as being part of the SEC because I already have. I have to be very honest with you because they're not even looking at the Big 12. And then Oklahoma State, number 24. And Ole Miss, there's another SEC team as the number 25 uh team in the land as we start the preseason. Now, will that stay? Probably not because all these SEC teams square off against one another. And there are going to be probably upsets. And there is going to be movement maybe from a team on the outside looking in and all the rest of it. Obviously, and this is why I think the Big Ten might be concerned. If you notice, Michigan was not part of that. And if you're the Pac-10 or the Pac-12 Utah, UCLA, even Stanford, which has had very good teams. And when I was growing up, I, I grew up during the era of uh, they had Jim Plunkett for those couple of years when they went to the Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl, and he, you know, upset Michigan and or Ohio State. So you have uh, quite a few teams on the outside looking in. Even Nebraska, which has gone through. Really, they have taken monster steps back, but who knows? They're, they are still Nebraska. I know they lost their first game of the year to Illinois. It looks like they're still kind of fighting a new, you know, trying to figure out their an identity, and also they're trying to wage their, their battles through the uh, Big Ten. But if you notice, a lot of teams on the outside looking in. 
uh, that as kids and as e even college, when I was in college, they just always seemed to be in, uh, actually in, in the discussion of who would finish as the number one team in the land. All right. So I, I'm going to return to college football. It's fun. It's exciting. But really what I want to turn myself to this week, and this is just something spur of the moment, like many of the shows I do are spur of the moment. And uh, I just want to do a little bit about Jerry Kuzma. Before I get to that, I'll do my other cartoon of the day. Coach says that your pitch limit is 89. And then I'll take the mound in the second inning. So we all know about Little League. And well, I tell you, the growth of the Little League, like the SEC, it has been phenomenal. More and more you watch these kids on TV, and they look like my, you know, professional minor leaguers. Really what the – well, I'm going to pivot here and just – uh, do an editorial. Really, with the advent of the metal bats and the plethora of home runs that are be, being hit at, at the Little League level, I would love to see the Little League say, you know what? For the World Series, we're going to go back to the wood bat. I know there's a ton of travel parents and baseball fans out there who are probably throwing stuff at me as they hear this right now. But really, how about baseball? Major League Baseball doing something and saying, "Let here's Major League Baseball that has played a Major League game in Williamsport. Has played the Field of Dreams game because they want to return to some sort of nostalgia and tradition of the game. Hey, how about for those two weeks that the Little League has played, just give all the players wooden bats. Who cares if they break? And it would be very interesting to see. How many of these kids could actually hit the ball? And I'm sure there are. You know, if you're a home run hitter, it doesn't really matter if you're using a, a wooden bat or a metal bat. The ball just rockets off your bat. But I'm talking about you know, some of these kids who just seem to sneak it over the fence courtesy of the metal bat. It would be nice, though, if Little League and Major League Baseball would say, you know what, let's just give the kids at, at the Little League level – uh, the wood bats. Actually, in a league I play in, we actually have a two-week uh, part of the season where we just use the wood bats. And now look, they're not great bats in, in the most part. <laughs> Many of them do break and all the rest of it. But it is a return kind of, and it's more of an appreciation uh, for how the game was played and that it's not dominated by, let's say, that big uh, – guy who just can hit the ball 800 yards with a metal bat. It's a totally different game with the wood bat. And I would love to see that with the Little League because these kids are schooled. They practice, practice, practice. I would love to see maybe, and I, I'm starting to sound like an old old goat here, but a little bit more bunting, a little bit uh, more wood on the bat, more plays in the field courtesy maybe of a wood bat and the kids maybe not trying to go downtown and the launch angle and all the rest of it. So it would be fun to see Major League Baseball getting together with Little League Baseball and return the wood bat to our nation's game. And it is America's game. And it has grown from America's game to becoming a worldwide game. Although I'll tell you, watching baseball on TV – because of home runs and strikeouts and walks being the big three things, it's tough to watch. And it's tough to watch a three-and-a-half-hour game. And what's worse is when you get rain delays for it. But I digress. Here's why I brought up uh, the cartoon. And um, my the second half of this program, because I really thought what would be interesting – Jerry Kuzman is being honored this week, and I'm going to give you the pictures right now of Jerry Kuzman. I did some research on Kuzman. 
I have to be very honest. I didn't do it as in depth as I did, let's say, Johnny Vandermeer, or last year I did one program on Tom Seaver and his 300 wins. I, I oh, actually, all of his decisions, which were uh, probably about 500 total or over 500 total decisions. But I wanted to see this. You know, Jerry Kuzman, I'm looking at his stats. Let me just get these two. This is a 1971. I don't think, I know I, I will tell you this. I showed this specifically. I have seen a pristine, I had uh, buddies of mine uh, who showed me this card. Of course, they have it in glass or in plastic or whatever, but it's in mint condition. This has to be one of the most expensive cards for collectors today. And the reason being, it's the 1968 Rookie Stars. And who uh, is on the uh, card? None other than Jerry Kuzman. Oh, who's that other guy? Oh, right, Nolan Ryan. But I saw a pristine, mint condition card. And for the collectors out there, you know what I'm talking about. When it's mint condition, it's basically never been touched by a human being. It went from, from machine to wrapping paper, you know, to the wax uh, wrap paper to somebody maybe touching the edges of it to put it in plastic. But that would fetch quite a bit of money. And of course, it's always the same old thing, whatever someone is willing to pay. But I just know that that 68 rookie mech card with Ryan and Kuzman uh, is a bundle. This one is 69, um, probably his, you know, he finished second in the rookie of the year in 1968. And this is what I mean about Kuzman. To me, he's always been an interesting guy because I, I really thought he was a really good pitcher. Uh, I always felt he should have been probably the MVP of the 69 uh, World Series, not Don Clendenin, because he won two games and really brought the Mets back from the abyss. You know, Seaver gets beaten game one, 4-1, kind of uh, handily. And Kuzman comes back and beats the Orioles the next day in Baltimore to bring the series back to New York, tied 1-1. And what was big about that was that it gave the Mets an opportunity to win all three games at home and not obviously return to Baltimore for game six and or seven. And Kuzman is interesting because I was going through his stats today, and pardon me, if and I'm going to try to stop the glare off my glasses. I'm going to enlarge the stats. I always thought he was a good pitcher. He finished 222 and 209 for his career, only a 515 winning percentage. ERA, pretty decent, 3.36. But I broke down two sets of three years, his first three years in the league with the Mets, and then 1976, 77, and 78. And the reason why I use those three is this. That was a transition year. Actually, it was a transition point as many Met fans realize, they went from, uh, that was the post-69-73 Mets going into that totally terrible uh, late 70s, early 80s before they got Strawberry and Gooden and, and uh, rebuilt the team, courtesy of Frank Cashin and Davey Johnson and all the good picks that they made. But here's why I bring, and Kuzman I, I find is so fascinating, and that is this. In 67, he comes up, he loses his first and only two uh, starts that year. Um, he lost, actually, to Ray Sadecki, a future teammate, all right, in 1967. Actually, I have it right here, uh, the two guys he lost to. He lost to, and he loses to Mike Cuellar, who was pitching for the Astros back then. Anyway, he lost to Cuellar, interestingly enough, and I didn't break it all the way down that way. Um, the number of pitchers. I did it, and then I was like, no, you know what? I want to concern myself with this. So he lost those first two. But in 68, he wins 19 games. The following year, 1969, he wins 17. And then in 1970, he didn't struggle. But when I was going through baseball reference, I think either he got hurt or he just had a ton of non-decisions. And he went like almost a month from like, uh, about late May to about late June, where he didn't get a decision. 
So you're talking about three, four possibilities of either a win or a loss, but he still had a winning record. So in those three years from 69, 69 and 70, and remember, the Mets were not a good team in 68. They were getting better. I think they were 73 and 89. And he won 19 games, 12 defeats, 613 winning percentage. The next year, he has his uh, second highest winning percentage of his career, 654. And of course, the Mets win the World Series, uh, 17 and 9. He actually, when you think about it, goes 19 and 9. I don't think he had a decision in the playoff rounds with the Braves. But you're talking about a guy who's 36 and 21. Then the following year, 1970, and the Mets came down. Uh, they do finish over 500, but they were really never in the running. They finished 83 and 79. Yet he does finish over 500. It's at a 632 winning percentage. He's 12 and 7. Maybe, you know, you expect more and stuff. You say, ah, you know what, 12 and 7. I know a lot. But, you know, you do 12 and 7. You do that for 10 years. You're 120 and 70. You do it for 20. You're 240 and 140. You're 100 games over 500. So in those three years, he won 48 games and lost only 36 times. If I'm doing the, 28 times, doing the math right. Then 71, he goes down. He's 6 and 11. Then he's 11 and 12 and 72. And 73, he's 14 and 15. Uh, his last, and of course, he pitches for the Mets in the World Series. You know, the Mets only, I think they only had one. No, they had two guys over 500 on their pitching staff. Tom Seaver, who won the Cy Young, and George Stone. And George Stone, he meets quite a bit uh, of times in his uh, in some of the research that I did. He met him a few times, and I think uh, like three or four times, which is a lot. Okay? Uh, he goes 11 and 12, 14 and 15, and 6 and 11. All right, so he's under 500 for those years. But he's only five, six, seven games under 500. So he's still over 500 for his Mets career. 74, he goes 15 and 11 in a year that the Mets are 71 and 91. And they got, were totally destroyed by injuries. Plus, again, it was post-73. They came down quite a bit. Seven, um, 75, he gets back up to the winning uh, side. He's 14 and 13. But now these are the three years I do. 76, 77, and 78. And to be fair, I forgot about 78. But in 76, probably his best season of his life. He's 21 and 10, highest winning percentage of his career, 677. And he has a 2.69 ERA, way below his career, 336. The next year, he's 8 and 20. Followed by 1978, he's 3 and 15. He gets traded over that winter. He goes back home. He's from Appleton, Minnesota originally. He plays for the Twins. He wins 20 games out of the gate. In two years with the Twins, here's the strange thing. In two years with the Twins, he goes 20 and 13 and 16 and 13. He goes 36 and 26. And then basically, he goes down. He actually loses the most games in the league twice now. He lost in the American and in the National. That's a good record. I got to look that up too. How many pitchers have led both leagues in most losses in a season? Because he does lose 20 with the 77 Mets. And it's not as bad as that. And it is true. Guys or pitchers who lose 20 can't be all that bad of a pitcher. And Actually, Kuzman wasn't, and I'm going to show you the stats in a second. But he loses 13 of 17 decisions in the strike short in season of 81 and then kind of bounces around. He winds up with the uh, 84 and 85 Phillies, and that ends his career. Actually, at the age of 41 for the Philadelphia Phillies, he actually goes 14 and 15 with a 3-2-5 ERA. Not too bad. So he finishes his career 229 and 209. 13 games over 500. And if you take a look, most of the teams he played on were probably under 500. So you're talking about a guy who's 13 over. I know the 67, 68 Mets were under 500. The 74 Mets, under 500. 77 and 78 Mets, way under 500. 79 Minnesota, I got to look that up. I don't think they were under 500. Let me just take a look. 
they were 82 and 80, followed by uh, the 80 twins that were just terrible. They finished 77 and 84. The 81 team where he split time, uh, they were 17 and 39. Or actually 41 and 68, those twins. He goes to the White Sox, and they are um, – Remember, they're in the rebuilding mode too, but the 81 White Sox finished 54 and 52. Okay, over 500. The next White Sox are 87 and 75, but then he goes to, of course, the Phillies. And of course, the Phillies have some good, good seasons there. In fact, 83, they won the pennant. 84 and 85, okay, struggling, etc. So my whole point is this. He's really... Um, a good pitcher. And really, I was looking. The guy had a 50-plus war. I think it's like 50.3 war for his career. That's not too bad. All right. So, and I'm going to leave it up to you. You tell me. Here he is as a all-star, making the 68 all-star team that played in Houston and finishing behind Johnny Bench, certain and... Uh, Hall of Famer, automatic Hall of Famer he was, and here's Jerry Cruz in 1970. Okay, so ready for this, just like I did with Johnny Vandermeer. You tell me, in 1968, 1969, and 1970, like I said, he won 19, he won uh, 17, that's 36, and he won 12. So he won 48 games those three seasons. Ready for this? Kuzman received, here's the run support for the Mets. This is what they averaged in 68. The Mets averaged 2.87 runs per game. That's what their offense managed in 1968. When Kuzman was on the mound, they gave Kuzman 3.58 run support and he won 19 games. Now you start to say to yourself, well, what comes first, you know, the uh, the chicken or the egg in this sense? And that is, and this is something I will debate and argue with the people who are with the metrics and saying wins aren't that important. Maybe they're not, and you can say that maybe the pitcher is the beneficiary of everything that goes on the field with the other eight players that are on the field. But I will tell you this: just playing. Ball, and of course, never at a high level. Believe me, never at the high level. It's weekend warrior status. But you know that there are certain guys, when they go on the mound, they give you a certain air of confidence. And it's the way that they not only project themselves, it's the way that they manage the game on the mound. It's the amount of time they spend between pitches on a mound. Because let's face it, one of the reasons that Bob Gibson was so successful was just give me the ball back and let's throw. He kept everybody on their toes. He kept them alert. There's nothing worse than really pitchers who take forever on the mound. And if you ever take a look, it seems like they are walking a plethora of batters. And it always seems to be they're struggling. Now you can say, well, they're struggling because they're not getting anybody out or they're walking so many. But I always thought about this. If they just stepped up a little bit on their pitch delivery time, would they be better pitchers? Anyway, here's what Kuzman had going for him. Run support, 3.58. It's well, almost a run. Well, I shouldn't say it's a um, It's 0. 0.71 higher when Kuzman took the mound in 68. In 69, when he won 17 games, the Mets scored on average 3.19 runs per game. Kuzman got 3.31 run support. And his best in his career that I saw was in 1970 when he only won 12 games. The Mets scored 3.89 runs per game, their highest of the three years. Kuzman actually got 5.53 run support and he won 12 games. Now, conversely, the Mets in 68, 69, and 70, here's what they their uh, defense was allowing per game. 
In 68, the Mets' defense allowed 3.06. Kuzman, when in his games, the defense was allowing 2.90. Kuzman wins 19 games. The following season, when Kuzman wins 17, the Mets as a team averaged uh, allowed 3.34 runs per game. His was a little higher, interestingly enough, 3.90. Yet he won 17 games. And in 69, the Mets, as a team, were allowing 4.29 runs per game. Kuzman was allowing 3.89 runs per game. Clearly, Kuzman was doing his job on the mound. Now, let's talk about 76-78. Or 76, 77, and 78. In 76, perhaps his best year, here's what the Met support was. In 76, runs per game, the Mets were averaging 3.8 runs per game. When Kuzman took the nat mound, it was 3.9. In 77, and this is where the contrast goes, the Mets... In non-Kuzman games, averaged 3.62 runs per game. When Kuzman took the mound, they averaged 2.96. And in 78, when he lost 15 of 18 decisions, the Mets' runs per game was 3.75. They gave Kuzman two and a half runs per game to work with. The run prevention... In 76, Kuzman allowed 2.61, the Mets as a team 332, way below. Again, in 77, run prevention. Ready for this? The Mets allowed four runs per game. Kuzman, way below, 3.7. And in 78, when the Mets were giving up 4.26 runs per game in one of their worst years ever, Kuzman, 3.94 runs per game their defense. Now, what does it say about Kuzman? Well, interestingly enough, I think obviously the 20 losses that he suffered for the Mets in 77 were not indicative of the pitcher he was. I think for the most part, the pitcher that you saw was most likely the pitcher in 1969 that won 17 games and lost only nine. But more importantly, he won two big games in the World Series. This is my salute to Jerry Kuzman, one of the best Met pitchers from the 60s and early 70s. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. Thank you for joining me. I'll be back with another edition next week. And of course, thank you for always allowing me to come into your homes and talk everything sports. And to Howard Fredericks for producing the show. See you next week.